Welcome to the Rigid Intermediate Bulk Container IBC webinar. Mr. Herb Spann originally presented this webinar. We'd like to thank Mr. Spann for all the work he did in putting together this presentation. This map illustrates the locations of the various members of RIBCA who manufacture IBCs and contains a listing of the associate or supplier members. RIBCA's mission is to foster the interests in the persons, firms, and corporations engaged in the business of manufacturing or assembling rigid intermediate bulk containers. In this presentation, we will cover topics about intermediate bulk containers, IBCs in general, rigid plastic IBCs and their components or accessories, steel IBCs and their components and accessories, performance-oriented testing of rigid IBCs, and the significance and information contained in the UN mark. An intermediate bulk container is a rigid or flexible portable packaging other than a cylinder or portable tank designed for mechanical handling. IBCs are used for the transportation and storage of hazardous material in a wide range of industries such as agricultural and industrial chemical sectors, as well as food and pharmaceuticals. Based on the hazardous materials regulations, the capacity restrictions of an IBC are based on the intended contents. For liquids, the minimum capacity is 119 gallons or 450 liters. The maximum volumetric capacity is 793 gallons or 3,000 liters. For solid materials, the minimum capacity is 882 pounds or 400 kilograms. The maximum capacity is 106 cubic feet or 3 cubic meters. Identification codes for IBCs are based on the three parts of an IBC. First, the type and service of the IBC, which is represented in a two-digit number signifying whether the IBC is rigid or flexible and intended for liquids or solids according to the chart. Second, the material of construction, which is represented by a capital letter. In the case of a composite IBC, which consists of an inner and outer packaging, two letters are included in the code, with the first letter representing the material of construction of the inner and the second the material of construction of the outer packaging. And the third part refers to the structural design of the IBC and is represented by a 1 or a 2. The number 1 signifies the IBC is designed so that the structural elements of the IBC bear the stacking load. The number 2 signifies the IBC is designed so that the body bears the stacking load. According to the hazardous materials regulations, there are three basic parts of a rigid IBC. First is the body, the receptacle of the IBC. Second is the service equipment, which includes equipment used for filling, discharge, pressure relief, safety, heating, insulation, and measuring. Third is the structural equipment, which includes components used for reinforcing, fastening, handling, protection, or stabilizing members of the IBC. All rigid plastic IBC design types have the letter H in common whether intended for liquids, solids, or regardless of how it is designed to carry the stacking load. Common rigid plastic IBCs are shown and listed on this slide. In today's market, the vast majority of rigid plastic IBCs range from 120 to 550 gallons. A typical rigid plastic IBC consists of a rotationally molded body with molded openings which are used for filling and then typically closed with a 6 or 9 inch cap. Wall thicknesses typically fall between a quarter and a half inch. However, thicker and thinner IBCs are in use. Rigid plastic IBCs can be designed with 2 inch NPS or buttress threaded openings. Typical rigid plastic IBCs have a pallet or base designed to withstand the dynamic and static top load while providing a means of handling the container. Finally, rigid plastic IBCs have a discharge valve. These valves are available in different styles and sizes to suit the application. 
Rigid plastic IBCs can be fitted with a variety of different accessories to accommodate a wide range of chemicals and various equipment such as valves, caps, plugs, vents, draw tubes, and microvalves. Almost any component can be used as long as the component can meet the testing requirements of the hazardous materials regulations. IBCs can also be manufactured from steel. The identification code for a steel IBC design is 31A. 31 represents liquids, and A represents the material of construction, steel. The metal IBCs illustrated here are constructed of welded carbon steel or stainless steel. The use of these metals allows for a wide range of options and customization during construction, whereas rigid plastic IBCs are limited to the mold design used to form the IBC. Steel IBCs in use today range from 120 to 793 gallons. Steel IBCs normally consist of a welded carbon or stainless steel body with various lids and bungs or opening options. Openings are welded in place and also constructed of steel. This allows for numerous size and location options. Structural equipment is also welded to the body, which allows for variations in leg heights, top lifting options, fork tube and protective guarding options. Discharge valves are available in many styles and sizes. The valve locations can be varied, including side drain, front center drain, FCD, and true center drain, TCD. Steel IBCs can be lined with plastic to resolve compatibility issues. Similar to plastic IBCs, steel IBCs can be fitted with a variety of different accessories, such as valves, lids, vents, plugs, and draw tubes as illustrated here. Again, as long as the component can meet the requirements of the hazardous material regulations, it can be used on an IBC. Performance-oriented packaging testing of IBCs is required by federal law, specifically the hazardous material regulations. This testing provides proof that the packaging can safely contain hazardous materials and withstand the normal conditions of transportation. It is the responsibility of the packaging manufacturer to ensure their packaging is capable of passing the prescribed tests. However, final closure of the packaging is the responsibility of the person who offers a hazardous material for transportation. Final closure must be completed in accordance with the packaging manufacturer's closure instructions, which are the same as used to close the packaging during certification testing. Title 49 of the Code of Federal Regulations, 178 Subpart O, is the section of the Hazardous Material Regulations which sets forth the requirements for the testing of IBCs. The design qualification and requalification testing are to be conducted in the following sequence on a single sample. Vibration, bottom lift, top lift if designed to be handled in this manner, stacking if designed to be stacked during transportation, leak proofness test for liquids, hydrostatic pressure test also for liquids, and a drop test. The regulation allows for the drop tests to be conducted on the same sample or a separate sample. Design requalification is to occur annually. For the prescribed drop test, the IBC is filled with the test liquid to not less than 98% of overflow capacity. When testing solids, the IBC is filled to not less than 95% of its capacity with representative contents. When testing for liquids, Composites and rigid plastic IBCs are filled with a water and antifreeze solution. When testing steel IBCs, just water is used since the test is conducted at ambient temperature. The IBC and the contents are conditioned to the specific test temperature. Composite and rigid plastic IBCs are conditioned to 0 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 18 degrees Celsius. Steel IBCs are tested at ambient temperature. The IBC must be dropped from a height in accordance with the specified packaging, packing group, and specific gravity of the intended contents. This chart illustrates the requirements.
the IBC must be dropped onto a rigid, smooth, flat, and horizontal surface, and the point of impact must be the most vulnerable or weakest part of the base. Following the drop, the IBC must be restored to an upright position for observation. An IBC passes if there is no continued loss of its contents. Here is an example of a rigid plastic IBC drop test. The vibration test is the first test conducted. The IBC is filled and closed as for shipment. The IBC is placed on a vibrating platform, which has a vertical or double rotary amplitude with a peak-to-peak -peak displacement of one inch. The vibration frequency must cause the packaging to be raised from the vibrating platform so that material of approximately one sixteenth of an inch, such as a shim, can be passed between the bottom of the IBC and the platform. The test duration is one hour. An IBC passes if there is no rupture or leakage. Here is an example of a rigid plastic IBC undergoing a vibration test. For the bottom lift test, IBCs must be loaded to 1.25 times the maximum permissible gross mass of the container. For each forklift entry direction, the forks must be centrally positioned and three quarters of the way through. The IBC is to be lifted clear of the ground twice. An IBC passes if there's no loss of contents and no permanent deformation which renders the IBC unsafe for transportation. Next comes the top lift test, if the IBC is intended for top lifting. In this test, the IBC is filled and top loaded to two times the maximum permissible gross mass. For composite and plastic IBCs, a pair of diagonally opposed lifting devices are used so that force is applied for five minutes in a vertical position and towards the center at a 45 degree angle to vertical. For steel IBCs, the IBC is lifted in the manner designed for a total of five minutes. An IBC passes if there is no loss of contents and no permanent deformation which renders the IBC unsafe for transportation. Next comes the stack test. If an IBC will be stacked during transportation, a stack test is required. The IBC is filled to the maximum permissible gross mass. The IBC is tested with the stack load greater than 1.8 times the gross mass times the number of packagings intended to be stacked. For rigid plastic and composite IBCs, the test duration is 28 days at 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 40 degrees Celsius. Metal IBCs are stack tested for 5 minutes at ambient temperature. An IBC passes if there is no loss of contents and no permanent deformation which renders the IBC unsafe for transportation. For design requalification, dynamic compression testing may be used. The next test in the series is the leak proofness test. The leak proofness test is conducted using a gauge pressure of not less than 20 kPa or 2.9 psi for a suitable amount of time. The leak proofness of an IBC is determined by coating the seams and joints with a soap solution. Other alternative methods suitable for detecting leaks are prescribed in the hazardous materials regulations. An IBC passes if there is no leakage detected. A leak proofness test is required to be completed at the time of manufacture on every IBC intended for liquids or solids discharge under pressure. IBCs intended to hold liquids must then be subjected to a hydrostatic test. The IBC is filled with water and pressurized to the design pressure rating for the rigid plastic IBC and composite IBC. This pressure is derived from the vapor pressure of the intended contents. The test is conducted for 10 minutes. Steel IBCs are subject to a different test procedure. Steel IBCs are pressurized to 29.4 psi or 65 kPa for 10 minutes and then 29 psi or 200 kPa for 10 minutes consecutively. The IBC may not be mechanically restrained during the test. 
an IBC passes if there is no leakage or permanent deformation which renders the IBC unsafe for transportation. Here is an example of a hydrostatic test at 100 kPa. Please note that in this example the test is sped up. After testing and certification, a UN mark must be applied to the IBC. Each packaging manufacturer is responsible for ensuring that each UN DOT marked packaging meets the requirements of the hazardous material regulations. Every IBC is to be marked in a durable and clearly visible manner. The letters, number, and symbol of the mark must be at least one half inch tall. This chart helps us decode the UN mark on an IBC mark. Each IBC is marked with the UN symbol followed by the UN design code. Next is a capital letter representing the packing group of the container. Packing group 1 materials are not allowed to be packaged in IBCs. Packing group 2 is signified by Y and packing group 3 is signified by Z. The month and year of manufacture and the country authorizing the mark follow. A manufacturer mark can be displayed as an M number, which is registered with the Department of Transportation, the DOT certified third party and test lab certification number, or the manufacturer's name and address. Next follows the stacking test load in kilograms, then the maximum permissible gross mass, also in kilograms. Additional markings required for rigid and composite IBCs include the rated capacity in liters at 20 degrees Celsius, the tear mass in kilograms of the IBC, the gauge test pressure in KPAs, this is not required for steel IBCs, the month and year of the last leak-proofness test, and the month and year of the last inspection. Although not shown in this illustration, Additional markings are required for metal IBCs including the maximum load, discharge pressure if applicable, the body material and minimum thickness, and the manufacturer serial number. An additional mark required by the DOT is the stack marking. All IBCs manufactured, remanufactured, or repaired after January 1, 2011 are required to have additional markings illustrated here. The IBC is to be marked with a symbol that describes the stacking capability of the packaging, specifically whether or not the IBC is designed for stacking during transportation. Additional marking requirements apply to the inner receptacle of a composite IBC. These markings include the UN design code, the month and year of manufacture of the receptacle, the manufacturer of the receptacle, and the country authorizing the mark. Any questions, you may contact Susan Nauman, Executive Director, at snauman at industrialpackaging.org, 410-544-0385.